angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. In 1980, in rural Georgia, a monument that some have described as America's Stonehenge was erected. Massive granite slabs inscribed with a postmodern Ten Commandments. It's been a mystery for the last 35 years. The man responsible for this monument identified himself with a pseudonym, R.C. Christian. It's been a mystery for 35 years, but not any longer. Welcome to Skywatch TV. In studio with me is uh, my best friend and wife, Sharon K. Gilbert. I'm Derek Gilbert, and our guest is the writer and director of a fascinating new documentary that finally answers the question, who is R.C. Christian? The documentary is Dark Clouds Over Elberton, the true story of the Georgia Guidestones. It's our honor to welcome to Skywatch TV the founder of Adullam Films, Chris Pinto. Chris, welcome. Hey, great to be here with you guys. We were really blessed to watch this yesterday in preparation for the program today. And I have to say that you and your colleague, Dr. Michael Bennett, have, in our opinion, cracked a mystery that has puzzled people for 35 years. Um, for some background, though, because many aren't familiar with the Georgia Guidestones, mm -hmm. tell us a little bit, of what, what is this monument? What is this place and why, why were you interested in it to begin with? Well, I first learned about this years ago from you probably remember Dr. Stan Monteith. Yes and uh, his whole radio program and his whole ministry and so on. But I, I first heard about it from Dr. Stan. And uh, then we talked about it in one of my earlier films called Megiddo to the New Age. And I did just a brief segment on the Georgia Guidestones. But basically back in 1979, a mysterious stranger shows up in this small town in, called Elberton, Georgia, which is known as the granite capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're, they're known for making you know, monuments. They make a lot of tombstones and things like that. And they have all of these granite quarries and so on. And so this, this gentleman shows up, very well-dressed guy. And he goes into a uh, granite company. And he meets with a guy named Joe Fendley, who was the owner of the company. And he says he wants to build this large granite monument. Mm -hmm. And he wants it to be like 18 to 20 feet tall or something. And he gives these dimensions. But he won't give his real name. And so he gives a false name, a pseudonym, mm -hmm. and he calls himself R.C. Christian. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Mr. Fendley, as the story goes, wasn't sure whether or not to take him seriously. Well, I can relate to that. Yeah. I mean, I, I spent a number of years in sales in the steel industry, you know, selling raw steel, basically, or steel uh, for, for construction, manufacturing, and so forth. And if somebody came to us and said, I'd like to place an order for a lot of steel, but I'm not going to tell you who I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, so he was, he was concerned because he, he could tell this is going to be a very expensive project. It's a lot of rock. Yeah. And, and, and we're not, we're obviously, his position was, we're not going to work on this kind of thing unless we know that you can, that you're serious and that you can pay for it. Right. So he sends him over to a local banker, a man named Wyatt Martin, um, and says, okay, we'll go and meet with Mr. Martin and let's work out the financial side of this thing and then we'll go from there. And he still didn't know whether or not to take him seriously. Uh, so then he goes over to the local bank there in Elberton, meets with this, uh, this gentleman, Wyatt Martin, who's the president of the bank. And they sit down and he tells him what he wants to do. And, uh, and Wyatt Martin says, you know, why, he tells him that, that he's chosen the pseudonym R.C. Christian. He says, well, why did you choose the name R.C. Christian? He says, well, because I am a Christian. Hmm. So the man claimed to be a Christian, interestingly, uh, which we bring out in the film. Uh, but then Wyatt Martin says, well, okay, I'm, you know, I can facilitate the financing for this. But he says, I can't set up a bank account under a false name. So you're going to have to give me your real name. And so the man said, okay, I'll give you my real name and my real information under the condition that you don't tell anyone who I am and maintain my anonymity. That's what he wanted. So that was the condition. So Wyatt Martin said, okay, he agreed to it. And then he sets up the account, handles the financing and so on. But he 
kept the identity of RSC Christian secret mm -hmm. all of this time. So he's known historically where this monument is concerned as the one man who knows the true identity of RSC Christian. Mm -hmm. And nobody else, not Joe Fendley, uh, not anybody who worked on the project, uh, nobody knew who he was, and only a very few people actually met him in person. But then the monument was built, it went up in 1980, and it had these 10, you know, what some people call the 10 commandments of the new age, mm. sometimes they call them the 10 commandments yeah. of the antichrist, that's another. Mm -hmm. Well, they're disturbing. Yes. <laughs> well, when you start out with the call to reduce the population of the world by more than 90%, mm -hmm. yeah. that, that raises a red flag. Yeah, that's, that's the first, there's like, he calls them guides though. He says they're not commands, they're guides. So the first guide, as he called it, was to maintain a world population uh, below 500 million people. Mm -hmm which would mean that billions of people would have to die. Right, the current population of the world is what, about seven and a half billion, right. so you'd have to lose about seven billion people. Right, and back in 1980, it was, it was still over five, five billion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So that, as soon as it was erected, as soon as it went up, people were looking at, uh, looking at these commands or these guides and so on, and they were very concerned, you know, who is this guy? Why, does he work for a larger organization? Is he working with the United Nations? Is this part of the new world order? Mm -hmm. uh, everybody had all of these questions and concerns, and, and those things have gone on, I think, for more than 30 years, hmm. and people have been concerned about it. But that's been the big mystery. Who is R.C. Christian, and what did he really intend by this monument. Hmm. You guys went directly to the source. You spoke with Wyatt Martin right. and many other people living in Elberton. Did you have any problems setting that up? Did they just go, first of all, did you tell them you were a Christian organization? And did, did they say, no, we don't want to talk to anybody about this? Well, we did tell them that we were a Christian organization and a Christian film company right off the bat. And it turns out that Wyatt Martin himself is a Christian man. Dynamic Christian yeah, man, which yeah. you're able to get on film. Some of the things he says are so challenging to any of us who are believers. Right. He knows his Bible. It was, it yeah. was uh, interesting because as a discerning Christian viewing this, uh, you, you begin to wonder as the film goes along, well, did Mr. Martin really know what he was involved in? But you're right. As Sharon mm -hmm. said, as you hear him speak, it's like, okay, he knows, he, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. he, he knows his Bible. Yeah, I, of, of the interview, you know, I've, I've done about 10 or so documentaries and so on. He is one of the favorite people that I've interviewed on, on any film mm -hmm. because he was very charming, a uh, gentleman, and he was a very nice man, and uh, and he was not shy about sharing his Christian faith, yeah. which was important to, to me and, mm -hmm. and Dr. Mike uh, Bennett, because uh, of course we're both Christians. So, um, but he was he was just a very a uh, very charming fellow. Mm -hmm. So, but no, uh, back to your question, they they were not hesitant. Most of them to talk to us. They like the attention on the monument because Elberton is a small town and they want the tourism, they want people to come there and visit, sure. stay in the hotels, et cetera. So they were actually very, uh, very friendly and very helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, other than these uh, guides, and again, you know, the guide that we reduce the population by more than 90%, uh, what are some of the other aspects of this monument that you find concerning? Well, it's a, it's a monument that promotes the environmental agenda, pretty clearly, it's talking about uh, not just maintaining a world population below 500 million, but then it gets into uh, guiding reproduction wisely. In other words, mm -hmm. manipulating the reproduction of human beings. Yeah, which sounds a great deal like eugenics. Which comes out later in the mm -hmm. film as we, as we uncover who mm -hmm. R.C. Christian really was. Mm -hmm. Uh, we discover that that's exactly where it leads. Yeah. He, was, he was part of the whole eugenics movement. The, the transhumanist movement, whether mm -hmm. some of the folks involved in this really recognize it or not, when they start talking about um, improving on God's design, um, and uh, there have been some now who've openly called for limits on human breeding because mm -hmm. there are some people who are breeding and they're not really responsible or perhaps their genetic makeup isn't what we desire they're really echoing the eugenicists of 100 years ago. And they use the very phrase yes. that the eugenicists used. Directed evolution. Self-directed Self evolution. evolution. So that's part and parcel of what went into the messages on the Georgia Guidestones. Well, not only that, but as we show in the film, on the Guidestones, it's there. And, and you see him saying, you know, guide reproduction wisely and this kind of thing. But then he published a book five years after the monument went up uh, called Common Sense Renewed in which he is 
uh, he published it under the name Robert Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, instead mm -hmm. of just R.C. Christian, he called himself Robert Christian. Um, and we talk about that in the film. But in, there, in that book, he is unfolding in much greater detail what he intended by these 10 guides on the monument. And he definitely, you know, he's talking about things like having government control of world population, that the governments need to get involved, the governments of the world, that this is a top priority, uh, that we should go down like they do in China, one-child families where you, you tell families you should only have one child and, and then have some kind of uh, punishment uh, by law mm -hmm. for people who go beyond one child and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so you're thinking about what they do in China with mm -hmm. forced abortions and this kind of thing. Uh, it becomes very dark and very sinister. That's why we call the film Dark Clouds over yeah. Elberton. Because at, when some people think the monument is intended to help mankind. But like you said, how are they going to help mankind? It becomes very... It, it becomes very sinister mm -hmm. at a certain point. Yeah. The question becomes, uh, ultimately, who gets to decide? Mm -hmm. uh, somebody has to make the decision. If we're going to cull the population by 7 billion people, somebody has to make the decision as to who goes and who stays. Who gets to have children? Uh, and and he, ultimately, it is going to be in the hands of, of fallen sinners rather than uh, you know, leaving, leaving it to God and it got, according to God's original design. Well, one of the points that you made in the film was that uh, R.C. Christian told the, the, the builders who put this together and, and also Mr. Martin that his vision was that this would be something he could leave behind in a permanent way. Books will perish if some catastrophe takes the earth and we are suddenly left without the Internet and without all of our mm -hmm. modern day conveniences and maybe without libraries. Here was his starting point for a brand new world order. To everybody start from scratch and follow these rules. Yeah, we, we talk about that in the film, how and, and Wyatt Martin makes the point. He says, you've got to remember that the monument was built back in 1979 and 80 when we were still involved in the Cold War, right, during right. the Cold War era, and the idea of some kind of nuclear catastrophe yeah. mm -hmm. that would wipe out civilization and then people would have to rebuild from there. Yeah. That's what's in view with his thinking. But when, when you read his book, he really kind of goes beyond that. And he's, he, whether there's a nuclear catastrophe or not, he believed that the governments of the earth should take action mm -hmm. on population control, definitely. Well, and, and, and this is an example of, of somebody who is trying to achieve heaven on earth through mankind's own works. Right. <laughs> we won't see heaven on earth until Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom. And even then we're going to mess it up before the end of the millennial reign, um, which will ultimately result in, in uh, you know, his, his ultimate kingdom, which will be eternal. Um, this is just one more example of humans trying to pursue a Luciferian agenda, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to be as gods, to control our own destiny, to create heaven here on earth. Well, that, the whole idea of a, a, a Luciferian agenda, one of the phrases that, it, that is employed for the Guidestones is let these be guidestones to an age of reason. And when you read that, and we asked Wyatt Martin if he knew what R.C. Christian meant by the phrase the age of reason, uh, or an age of reason, he uses both phrases. Um, Wyatt Martin didn't really know. He just says, oh, well, just an age of reason. But then when you read his book, Common Sense Renewed, mm -hmm. which he published later, he's clearly making reference to Thomas Paine, right. mm -hmm. who wrote the book, The Age of Reason. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Who was an atheist. Who was, was an atheist or, or a deist. Or, and and he, was, he had a very hostile, anti-Christian worldview. And The Age of Reason, the book, is calling for the abolishment of Christianity mm -hmm. and saying, well, we need to do away with Christianity and, and all organized religion. And so that's another... Uh, kind of sinister side to the monument, you know, is, is that what R.C. Christian really, really believed in? If you read his writings where he's at one point, he talks about how we should find ways to blend atheism with Christianity to mm -hmm. make our own religious views somehow or other compatible with atheism. <laughs> and, and you think, well, how could you do that without destroying Christianity? You, exactly. You know, By definition, that would mean we're not Christians anymore. Right, yeah. Uh, what did your research turn up regarding the involvement of uh, either in the construction or in how these monuments are viewed after the fact by either secret societies or occult groups? Well, there, the monument itself was built by Freemasons, and they openly admit that, hmm. that the, the main builder, Joe Fendley, 
uh, he, he was the guy who actually was responsible for the construction of the monument. He was a Freemason. Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne Mullinex, who donated the land, or didn't donate it, he, he actually provided the land, it was sold. Um, but Wayne Mullinex was also a Freemason, and that comes out in the film, we talk about that. He laid the foundation for the, the project. The design, the original design, because uh, one of the things we show in the film, we, we uncovered paperwork and files and things like that from the people who were involved that, that have never been published before. That's one of the things that, that we bring out in the film. But the original design has the monument, the original monument, and then there was going to be an outer ring of stones. Mm -hmm. A hinge. A, a hinge. A hinge. Exactly, because he wanted it to be more like Stonehenge. Huh. But then they ran out of money, apparently, uh. and so he couldn't afford the outer ring of stones. But if you look at the design, he had designed a sunstone for the uh, Georgia Freemasons, or the Atlanta Freemasons. Huh. Uh, and that's part of it. Now, he doesn't explain it. We couldn't find an explanation for it, but that is there. Hmm. We also found a letter or a message that appears to have been intended to go inside a time capsule which is beside the monument. They say, you know, time capsule buried. Mm -hmm. And then there's been speculation about whether or not they actually buried a time capsule. Some say, no, they didn't. Others say, well, maybe they did. And they, they don't want anybody to know because they don't want anybody to go out there and dig it up. Um, so we, we couldn't get a straight answer out of anybody, but they, they're obviously keeping it a secret. Mm -hmm. But the message uh, that seems to have been intended for the time capsule makes reference to the name R.C. Christian, as a reference to Christian Rosencrantz, who was the founder, oh. the mythical founder of Rosicrucianism. Right, 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 right. Okay. And people have talked about the Rosicrucian connection, but I've never seen anyone actually come up with documentation mm -hmm. that shows the connection. And that's what one of the things that we found by going and talking to the people who were involved. Now, the Rosicrucians, they're, they're even more secretive than, than Freemasons, are, are they not? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know very much about the Rosicrucians at all. They're, they're often called the most secret of the secret societies because one of the things that they promote, at Rosicrucianism is a blend of, you know, their symbols are the rose and the cross. Mm -hmm. The rose generally represents secrecy and the ancient mystery religion. And then the cross, of course, represents Christianity. So what they do is they blend paganism and Christianity together. Uh, and, and they will openly tell you that the ancient Egyptian mysteries and ancient Gnosticism and this kind of thing mm -hmm. is all part of the Rosicrucian philosophy. So that's another aspect of this, mm -hmm. where Rosicrucianism, if you read Rosicrucian writings, sometimes they can be very deceptive because they kind of sound Christian. Mm -hmm. at certain points because they'll make reference to biblical things mm -hmm. and you're never quite sure you know until you study it a bit more and then you realize they make these departures into paganism mm -hmm. so but there was clearly some kind of a rosicrucian connection in the film we uh we contacted because this letter now not only connects the name rc christian to rosicrucianism but then makes reference to the atlanta freemasons mm -hmm. or not the atlanta freemasons the atlanta rosicrucian society mm -hmm. oh. sorry did you contact them? We contacted them, could not get them to talk on camera because they are, you know, secret some, secretive, <laughs> secretive. Uh, but we asked them if they knew about the monument, if they, if they knew about these things, and they affirmed that they did, but they did not want to go on the record with us and, and talk about it. So we, we, we could only get so far in terms mm -hmm. of that investigation because yeah. they were pretty, they were pretty reserved about communicating too much. Yeah. About five minutes ago, uh, and I know that people are uh, thinking, now, when are you going to get to the stuff that you teased at the beginning of the program? <laughs> and I will say, in the interest of disclosure, that right now we are not going to disclose the identity of R.C. Christian on the program. But, but you do in the in But the in the film, you yeah. yes. do. And would like you to you know, share what was the key moment where you found the key pieces of evidence that led you to unlocking the identity of R.C. Christian? Well, the key, the key obviously, is, is Wyatt Martin, because he's the one man who knew the true identity of R.C. Christian. And we had found out in a uh, Wired magazine article that had been published earlier mm -hmm. that Wyatt Martin revealed in his interview that he did that he kept all of his paperwork in an old IBM computer case mm -hmm. out in his garage, or that's how I remember us reading it. And his garage turned out to be a shed in, in the back I mean, and you watch it unfold on camera. You see the whole thing happen. But we're talking to him. We ask him about the IBM computer case. 
and if he still has the IBM computer case, and he says, I do, and then we say, well, could we see it perhaps? And he says, no, 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 we can't. And then we keep talking to him, but he finally agreed to take us out and show us uh, the shed and the IBM computer case, and it's, a, it's, it's actually a very funny sequence. It's uh, a wonderful <laughs> sequence, and Mike is so good about <laughs> drawing this gentleman out and, and slowly teasing open that case, mm -hmm. allowing you to get camera work inside there and actually get images of a lot of those papers. Right. And he even read one of them to you. Yeah, Wyatt Martin, he pulls out one of the letters of R.C. Christian. He starts reading it on camera. And so it was, we, we, we gathered clues. He never told us. And, and you don't actually see the name of the real person mm -hmm. there. But there were clues there, and, we, and you watch it in the film. Mm -hmm. We're assembling the clues and putting them together. And then we go and we track down the real R.C. Christian and used Wyatt Martin's interview and then Hudson Cohn's interview, because Hudson Cohn also met R.C. Christian and took the, all the, the bits and pieces of the puzzle and that led us to his hometown, and we interview people who actually knew him in his lifetime, uh, and uh, and I I think it's very clear. Yeah, well, I, I would agree. Now, how did what you learned about R.C. Christian from the folks who knew him when, when he was still alive? He has passed on. Uh, how did that track with? I mean, was it consistent with the message of the Georgia Guidestones? Oh, definitely. That's the thing that's so. I mean, we we actually R.C. Christian passed away. Uh, and we actually go out to his gravesite at one point. Um, and so you, there, there's evidence there on his mm -hmm. tombstone that I don't want to give it away, but mm -hmm. there's evidence on his tombstone. Then we interviewed people who were local historians in his hometown who knew him personally. Mm -hmm. And just based upon what they knew of him personally, the, the evidence lines up. And then he was a prominent citizen in his hometown. Uh, and he had been written about in the local publications there. Mm -hmm. And we actually show different quotes from his kind of his worldview philosophy that he was well known for that are entirely consistent with mm -hmm. uh, the message of the Georgia Guidestones. So it, it all came together. The, the local historians that you talked to in R.C. Christian's hometown, how did they react when you said, this is what we have found about the Georgia Guidestones? What, how did they react when they, and did they even suspect that he well, was connected to this monument. No, no, no. They, they were astonished. They, they were really astonished that, uh, that, that he was involved with something like this, although it, it made sense to them based upon what they knew about him. Uh, and one of the things that we reveal, he actually worked with a friend. There, were, there was more than one person involved in all of this, but we bring that out in the film. And then we went and talked to the family member of one of the gentlemen that worked on this. And, and he turns out to be a very prominent citizen there in Elberton. And when we talk to him, he says, well, actually, if you knew, because he, he was the nephew mm -hmm, of one of mm -hmm. the men, he says, if you knew my uncle, actually, this, this is not a real big surprise. He even says that on film. Hmm, hmm. So uh, it, that was very, very interesting. Why hasn't anyone else been able to put these pieces together before? I think because nobody's been able to, to get as close to Wyatt Martin and to get Wyatt Martin to open up uh, and and to show his uh, his hidden files, his 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 hidden briefcase uh, of information. He talked about wanting to destroy it, or, or that he had intended to burn all of that information. But then he said he wanted to write a book on it, and then he didn't get around to writing the book and whatnot. Uh, so he was willing to show us some of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but w without that, I don't think we would have been able to track him down. Mm -hmm. So that that's what made all the difference. Because Wyatt Martin, he's the man who knows the true identity of the mysterious stranger who showed up back in 1979. Hmm. The uh, documentary film is called Dark Clouds Over Elberton, the true story of the Georgia Guidestones. We'd like to offer this to you. The mystery revealed after 35 years. Uh, the film is 24.95, and it is well worth seeing. Very well done. And again, the mystery, uh, I think, is compelling. The evidence is compelling that uh, Chris and his uh, colleague, Dr. Michael Bennett, have unlocked the secret of the Georgia Guidestones, what it's really about, and uh, who's responsible for it. But as an added bonus, we'd like to add a, uh, an essential book for your reference library, which is The Forbidden Secrets of the Labyrinth by Mark Flynn. Both of these, for the $24.95 price of the DVD, uh, you'll find the, uh, just look for the uh, special, the Chris Pinto special at Skywatch TV store 
Dark-Cloud.com. Uh, Chris, with just about a minute to go, uh, what do you hope viewers take away from watching Dark Clouds over Elberton? Well, you know, coming to the end of it, because we, we, where we wrap it up, we wrap it up with the idea of the age of reason and an, an age without Christianity. And studying what these men believed and the eugenics and the idea of population control, it's really based upon a very cold, I would even say heartless view of humanity. Mm. And, and we've all seen these stories with Planned Parenthood and the things that are going on there and what they're doing with unborn and partly born yeah. children and this kind of thing. Whereas in a world with Christianity, Christianity, you know, the Bible says that God has chosen uh, the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, the weak things to shame them that are strong. Uh, and so Christianity inspires us to reach out to those who are considered quite often uh, the lesser members of society and to deal with them in a very compassionate and a loving way. The Bible says that God has chosen the poor for salvation. And unfortunately in the uh, kind of the eugenics worldview, they look down on the poor and say, you know, if we could exercise population control, we could get rid of all of these people. Mm -hmm. Whereas Christianity goes the other way and says, no, we need to welcome them to, to the salvation of our Lord and bring them to the gospel. Amen. Amen. Chris Pinto is the writer and director of Dark Clouds Over Elberton, the true story of the Georgia Guidestones. Thank you for watching. As we keep watch, for Sharon Gilbert, I'm Derek Gilbert, and this is Skywatch TV. The holidays are on us, and this Christmas, Skywatch TV can help you give the gift of preparedness to the ones you love. How better to show your love to your family than to buy something that will help them when their electricity goes out, when everything fails, and we all know that there's a possibility of that yep. happening. This is the time to buy, because if you go to our store, you'll find the buy this, get that free special. And trust me, the buy this items, <laughs> they're already discounted. So you're going to save money on that. And you get a wonderful item in addition, free. That's right. Go to skywatchtvstore.com and look for the Christmas specials. Now, as a news junkie, uh, I'm really excited about some of the crank radios. When times get tough and you need to know what's going on. Are they just for can, cranks? Well, <laughs> as perfect for me then, because you can, without batteries, be able to find out exactly what's going on. They're crank radios, including a two-way radio, so you can communicate with friends and family in an emergency. I think that's incredible. We've got a hand crank radio at home that we use a lot. I hope it never happens, but right. more than likely the day is going to come, even if it's just a, a power outage from a storm, you're going to need something to hear the, the weather on. We've got seed kits, yes. the emergency ration kits, uh, Berkey water filters. I mean, it's the, all the things you wanted to get for prepping and you wanted to save money or you want to give to your family yeah. members, now's the time to buy. And many of those seed kits are heirloom seeds, the kind of things that you don't typically get when you go to the store to buy seeds, seeds that you can basically, uh, when when the plant ripens, you can save some of those seeds and plant them again next you year. You can. It's almost a buy once, have them forever sort of thing. If you just save from year to year. And they're non-GMO. Exactly. Plenty of other items in the store, including more information, books that tell you about how to prepare and plan for times that uh, are troublesome. And uh, certainly that would describe the age we're living in right now. Buy this. Get that free. You gotta love it. Yep. Give the gifts of preparedness this holiday season. Skywatch TV, skywatchtvstore.com. And again, Merry Christmas from Skywatch TV.